Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Catherine Conroy. I'm a project officer with Hunter Local Land Services. We're just letting everyone into the meeting room, and once that's done, we'll get um, going. So, good evening, everyone, and welcome to um, this webinar on mistletoe, um, the misunderstood woodland superhero. Um, thank you for all um, logging on and participating. Um, we're going to have three guest speakers um, talking tonight. So the first one is going to be, we've swapped the order around just because we've had a bit of a technical issue, but hopefully that's going to be resolved. So Mick Roddick will speak first. He's the New South Wales Program Manager for BirdLife Australia to do with their Woodland Bird Program. And he'll be followed by Christy Peters, who is a Project Officer for BirdLife Australia working in the Woodland Bird Program as well. And then followed by um, Professor Dave Watson, who is with Charles Sturt University, and he's an international expert on mistletoes, in particular Australian species of mistletoes, of which there are, I think is still 97 species was the last total I heard. And um, I, first of all, before we start, get going is like to give acknowledgement to um, the country on which we're meeting today. I'm sure we've got people from many different nations. I'm sitting and participating from Wanarua country in the Upper Hunter. So I'd like to acknowledge um, the elders past, present and emerging and pay my respects um, and recognise that we're meeting on their country today. So I'll hand over to Mick. Thanks, Catherine, and hi, everyone. Yes, yeah, so I'm Mick Roderick. I'm the New South Wales Woodland Bird Program Manager of BirdLife Australia. I'm just bringing up my talk. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge the Wobbaka people, um, the traditional custodians of the land that I'm sitting on now, uh, but also the Wanarua people, which, which are the traditional custodians and knowledge holders on the land and just about all the work that I do um, in the Upper Hunter and even down to the Lower Hunter. So uh, originally Dave was going to give us an introduction on just how incredible mistletoe is. Um, you're just going to have to take my word for it while I walk you through about uh, mistletoe in the Hunter Valley and how it has helped, um, well, how it helps shape our nationally important uh, woodland bird assemblage. And we've got a couple of nationally threatened woodland birds that rely on mistletoe in the Hunter Valley. So just to set the scene, um, the Hunter Valley, uh, there's, there's this concept of a of, of a Western influence, meaning that you know there are birds and other flora and fauna from west of the divide that occur in a, in in the Hunter Valley. So the Great Dividing Range generally follows the, the coast, sort of you know parallel to the coast till it gets to the to the Blue Mountains. Then it swings a long way west, and at the top of the Hunter Valley, a place called Ulan. Uh, the Great Dividing Range is less than 500 metres. It's only 470 metres high, um, and it's it's a long way west. It's almost as far west as Gunnedah and Narrabri. So there's these um, major barriers um, to the north with the Barrington Tops, to the south with the sandstone curtain of the Blue Mountains, and, of course, the ocean uh, to the east. But this physical barrier just does not exist to the west. Um, and so, in theory, that has enabled some western species to spill over into the coastal catchment of the Hunter Valley. And you can see on that image there, I'm not sure if people can see my mouse, but you can see what I'm talking about with that that sort of gap in the divide and also the, the low relief of, of, of the range there. And also with the what we call the valley effect, that we experience some pretty severe westerly winds um, in the Hunter Valley. And over, over a long period of time, presumably, those westerly winds have dried our, our vegetation out such that we're now left with, or um, well, we, we now had uh, sort of very dry, open uh, woodland habitat as opposed to, to the wetter habitats that you might find in other coastal catchments. Uh, that's a really good image there. That that really sort of drives it home. And you can see that, that really obvious gap in the, the Great Dividing Range there. Um, so just some examples of some of these Western bird species. I'm only going to mention three, really. Um, but probably the best one, I think, is the singing honey eater. Um, it's very much an inland bird and occurs mostly in low acacia scrub across most of Australia, but almost exclusively west of the Great Dividing Range in New South Wales, and with the exception at the top of the, the Hunter Valley. Um, that's a photo there taken actually as far down as Martindale, which is actually 
probably closer to the coast to to Yulan. Um, yeah, not a long way up the valley. So singing honey eaters do occur in the Upper Hunter, and they actually breed. Um, probably the best known is the painted honey eater, um, a mistletoe uh, specialist, um, and so it's also a bird that's generally. Uh, found west of, of, of the Great Dividing Range. Sometimes a bird or, or two will lob into Western Sydney and they might breed, but we actually get really good numbers of painted honey eaters in, in some seasons. It's not unusual to have 20 or 30 birds along a, a major river course such as the Widden Valley um, in, in some seasons. Um, and so you can see on that image there, uh, this is the, the Hunter River and this is the Goulburn River. So the Goulburn River forms uh, part of the a very large part of the the Hunter Valley catchment, and that's where nearly all of the the painted honey eater records are from in the Hunter. Spiny cheeked honey eater is another one. Um, again, more sort of open, dry country uh, west of the divide, but is now actually very common in the in the Hunter. So here we have uh, those three birds, and the lowest common denominator. Looking at those three images is this beautiful beast here, uh, grey mistletoe. Uh, so I like to call grey mistletoe as the hunter's super plant from the west. And that map there shows the distribution of grey mistletoe. Uh, so it occurs mostly on inland uh, wattles. Uh, don't, so these, these lines here are botanical subdivisions. They don't actually show catchments very well. But these, these dots out here, I hope people can see my, my mouse. These are all in the upper hunter. Um, and it's actually a super abundant plant in, in the Upper Hunter. It's just you drive along and you see grey mistletoe everywhere. So these are examples of some of the trees like Yarran and uh, Weeping Mile that they usually occur in west of the Divide. Uh, but in the Upper Hunter, uh, it's growing in Acacia linearifolia, folia, um, which is an abundant uh, tree or plant in the Upper Hunter. And with it, uh, the, the grey mistletoe has proliferated. Um, and it's become such a thing that uh, you know, grey mistletoe and painted honey eaters in, in the Hunter are, are, are so important and so widely recognised that um, Hunter Local Land Services recently um, commissioned Jenny McCracken to do a wonderful uh, 3D mural um, in Merry War. And I would thoroughly recommend to people that if they're passing through Merry War on the Golden Highway, going from Newcastle to Dubbo or or vice versa to drop in and, and check out this fantastic mural at the um, the skate park. So mistletoe isn't just important to those three birds, and I maybe may have forgotten to mention that the painted honey eater is actually listed nationally on the EPBC Act um, as a vulnerable species. So it's it's one of the few woodland birds that are listed nationally. There's a number of seabirds and shorebirds, but there aren't too many woodland birds that are actually na uh, listed on the EPBC Act. So whilst the painted honey eater is listed as vulnerable, the regent honey eater is critically endangered. Um, it has a population of almost certainly less than 300 birds. Um, it's pretty much on the brink of extinction, this, um, this bird. And as we speak, um, this is pretty sobering information um, that we actually don't know the whereabouts of, of any wild regent honey eaters right now. Um, middle of the breeding season, and we don't know where there's any birds. Um, they're out there somewhere, I'm sure, but it just gives you some idea of, of the sort of peril that this, this species is in. And I'll come back to those two photos in a later slide. So just giving context to just how important mistletoe is uh, to Regent honey eaters. Uh, in a way, I like to think that mistletoe has, has kind of seen Regent honey eaters through this, this incredibly sad bottleneck that they're going through. So just going back a few years to October 2019, um, here's a pair that bred along the Merry War River, and those birds were feeding on needle leaf mistletoe, which you can see in that image. It's not as not particularly clear. Um, thanks to George Gillam for that for that photo. Um, that's uh, a adult with a juvenile there. And that year, we only actually found five breeding pairs across the entire range, and at least two of those pairs were actually nesting and feeding in needle leaf mistletoe. Um, then in 2020, in the Widden Valley, again in the in the upper hunter catchment, um, they're at it again. And there's a, a photo of a nest in a, a river she oak. And a, that year again, we have very few nests, only six or seven nests across the entire range. And again, mistletoe featured um, with birds um, nesting in um, nettle leaf mistletoe or near nettle leaf mistletoe that is flowering. 
So fast forward to last year, uh, we actually had, would you believe, five nests um, along a stretch of river along the, along the Merriwell River where that photo from 2019 was, was taken. Uh, four of those five nests were successful. Um, and yep, there wasn't any eucalypt flower. The birds were subsisting almost entirely on mistletoe blossom. Um, and there's a great photo there from from Leah Murphy of one of the one of the parent birds feeding feeding a young. So this is literally last spring. Um, five nests, and there were many other nests also um, last year in in mistletoe. And Capity Valley um, was once the you know considered the stronghold for for the Regent honey eater. Whenever birds weren't nesting elsewhere, it was a kind of a case of oh it's okay because at least they're nesting in the Capity. Um, birds have really struggled to, to, to nest success successfully in the Capities since 2017. That was the last good season. Um, and in the last two seasons out there, um, the only successful nests in the Capity Valley have been nests that have been around needle leaf mistletoe. Um, so, yeah, so that gives some context to how important the mistletoe is in sort of more inland, um, drier environments. Um, but mistletoe is also very important to Regent honey eaters uh, locally. When I say locally, I mean in the lower hunter. So the long flowered mistletoe is a, um, it's a mistletoe that grows in the, uh, a place called the Tamalpa Woodlands. Um, it actually, well, I mean, it grows in spotted gums um, right through the, the range of, of the spotted gum tree, but it's of, of importance to Regent honey eaters in, in the Tamalpa Woodlands. So, it provides one of the two key uh, food resources for Regent honey eaters when they come to the Tamalpa woodlands um, to breed. Uh, apart from the mistletoe, the other is the broad-leaved ironbark, Eucalyptus fibrosa. So in, you may have noticed in my photos before, 2018 was missing. Um, so 2018 was a very um, unusual year. We didn't, we couldn't actually find Regent honey eaters anywhere um, during our standardised monitoring that we do. We cover, along with ANU, we cover roughly 1,400 sites uh, twice during the breeding season um, at their usual haunts looking for, for, for birds that are breeding. We didn't find any nests, any evidence of breeding in 2018. That was until late November when we found birds in the Tamalpa woodlands. And lo and behold, the birds were both feeding on and nesting in a long flowered mistletoe. Um, but then last year uh, we did uh, a captive release, so we did a release of zoo bred birds um, into the Tamalpa woodlands. So the Regent honey eater is in such dire trouble that we are actually breeding them in zoos. I guess first of all to make sure they don't go extinct full stop, so they will still exist in zoos. Hopefully it'll never come to that. But we also breed them in zoos um, to to um, supplement the wild population by releasing zoo bred birds every so often. So we did that in the Tamalpa woodlands last year, and we had a number of instances of birds feeding in the long flower mistletoe again. That female there um, is a first year bird. Um, we call her anvil tail. You can look at her uh, her tail feather there, which is quite unique. In fact, she's got a really unique molt that bird. But she she raised young. She's a wild bird. Um, and there she is um, getting stuck into the noodle leaf mistletoe. I'm mean, sorry, the long flowered mistletoe. So the take home from all of this, that mistletoe is important for birds generally, as, as Dave will um, convince you of more later. But I guess my point um, in my talk is to, to really drive home just how remarkably important it is in, in the Hunter Valley in particular for two species um, that are nationally um, listed as, as threatened, one of them on the brink of extinction, that really, to be fair, has almost been relying on mistletoe for the last four breeding seasons. So that'll do for me. I think I stuck to my 10 minutes. <laughs> So I'll... Thank you, Mick. I um, hope I was sharing all that time. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have the option to stop sharing, that's all. Somebody so, stop sharing for me. Yep. We'll hand over to Christy and do what she's got to tell us. <laughs> Are you guys seeing that okay? Yes. Yep, I am. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, all good. Oh, have I gone back to my notes? Here? Yeah, you have, yeah. Wait a minute, sorry. You're all right. Okay, all right. Um, 
yeah, hello everyone. I'm a Woodland Birds uh, Project Coordinator with BirdLife Australia. I work with Mick in the Newcastle area uh, in the Tamalpin Woodlands, as Mick was uh, just mentioning. And one of my key roles is to actually coordinate restoration of long flowered mistletoe in these woodlands. So I just want to tell you a little bit about the project we've been working on over the last few years. So one of the most important things about this project is that it's a great partnership project. There's lots of different organisations and community members involved. And this is just a lovely photo um, at that captive release that Mick just mentioned in 2021. So in the middle there is Tara Deva, the CEO of Minda River Local Aboriginal Land Council and Mick on the, on, your, on the right there. And then on the left is Lucas Grenady from the Department of Planning and Environment. So thank, we're thankful for this project that Minda River have let us work on their land. They've welcomed us onto Wanarua country. And we've got we've developed a really lovely relationship working with them over the last few years um, on this project, but probably over the last seven or eight years that Mick's been out there doing bird surveys and working on Regent honey eaters. So we're lucky to have received quite a bit of funding, government funding over the last few years to keep this project running. So just listing there some of acknowledging some of the funding support that we've received. And as Nick mentioned, um, so the, the superhero plant on the east coast is the long flowered mistletoe and uh, it's spring flowering. And Dave will tell you all more about this, but it's hemiparasitic. I'll leave that for Dave to explain what that means. Um, but this is a photo taken from the Tamalpan woodlands near Curry Curry. And it's growing on its main host tree, the spotted gum. So unfortunately, uh, at the Tamalpan Woodlands, there's been a series of um, quite intense fires over the last few years, uh, particularly in 2016 and 2017 fire seasons. And mistletoe, unfortunately, is killed outright when it's burnt. Um, it doesn't regenerate after fire, unlike a lot of our native plant species in Australia. And that means we've got to wait until primary seed disperses like the mistletoe bird or the painted honey eater that Mick was just talking about, spread that seed back into these burnt areas from adjoining from adjoining unburnt areas. Um, but unfortunately, that doesn't really happen um, in a very fast way in, in nature because mistletoe birds generally focus their foraging efforts on areas that have lots of um, fruiting mistletoe. So in areas where it's being killed off, we're trying a pro we're project out where we're trying to plant the mistletoe ourselves and that's going to fast track this natural process occurring. And then once we get it back in there, the mistletoe birds will hopefully be attracted to come back in and then help us out. So as I said, it's a great partnership project. We acknowledge um, all the photos in these presentations, the courtesy of Mindaribba Lauk, and um, we're very uh, grateful that we get to work in, in this beautiful patch of bush. So this is the project site. Um, if you're familiar with, um, so I've got the little inset map there showing you that we're to the west of Newcastle, about 35 k's to the west of Newcastle there. And this is the largest intact remnant, uh, or pretty much intact remnant on the valley floor and it's lowland woodland. And we've really, we've lost you know, up to 85% of our woodland habitat along the east coast of Australia. And this particular patch is home to many threatened species, uh, flora, fauna, like quite a lot of woodland bird species occur here, and a lot of the vegetation communities are threatened, are threatened communities as well, like the one that there's the spotted gum ironbark that Mick was mentioning. Um, this area also has a really complicated land ownership. So we have, you can see the green there, there's some existing national park, but the majority of the area where those yellow dots are, where the Regent Honey Eater records are, they occur on private land. So some of it, you know, is, is protected in that Mindaribra Lauk uh, don't, don't have any um, plans to develop that land and, and hold it for conservation purposes. But quite a lot of it you can see, I don't know, see if you can see my um, cursor there, but just where I'm pointing to, this development with the road going in has been known in the past as the um, Hunter Economic Zone, um, recently rebranded to the Hunter Energy Zone, uh, and a lot of different developments have been proposed there. Um, we're really hoping that no further development goes ahead because, as you can see, it's a key uh, place for where we find regent honey eaters, both during the non-breeding season and the breeding season when we have the right flowering conditions. 
So this is just to show you the large expanses that were burnt um, and they were burnt quite badly. And you can see that they do cover a lot of the areas where we've, we've found Regent honey eaters there. And this is just to show you just how bad the fires were. They really did burn everything right nearly up to the tips of the canopy. And it had a profound impact at this site, killing over 90% of the mistletoe where these fires burnt. So we, we really did, we took this um, site really took a hit with what we've lost there from the mistletoe side of things. So just got another couple of photos. These are very famous photos that Mick had in his presentation. But as he said, it's a key resource for the Regent Honey Eater for foraging and nesting and um, the site of two modern breeding events um, with lots of birds recruited into the wild there. So the Tamalpan Woodlands is really considered at the moment to be the key breeding area in New South Wales for this species. So the project that we're doing is believed to be a world first. Um, we've done a large scale inoculation of host trees within, a, within the burnt section of the Tamalpan woodlands. We started in 2020 and we're still going in early, we went through to early 2022 and then I'll tell you about some funding that we've just received to continue on with this project. So what we're hoping to do is um, supercharge the native woodland ecosystem and, and hopefully keep those regent honey eaters coming back to breed there. And Dave's going to mention this in his presentation, but there's been some really interesting research come out about how important mistletoe is for um, as a drought resource and also um, forests that contain it are climate change refuges for threatened, threatened bird species like the Regent honey eater. So you'll talk a little bit more about mistletoe and um, drought later on. So basically um, what we've done, we've done baseline surveys to look at the burnt and unburnt areas we, we did actually try to start this back in June 2022, but we're now learning about mistletoe that it can be a bit fickle with the phenology. Some years it'll fruit really well and be really abundant, and then other years, like in 2020, I think just as we're coming out of the drought, we could barely find any. We scraped together about 80 pieces of fruit and got them planted. But thankfully, in, in the coming years, once that drought broke and we've had all this rain, uh, each year now we're getting you know an abundance of seed. It's more um, not so much limited by... Uh, fruiting, it's, it's just limited by the um, availability of our arborists and our team to get out there and plant as much as we can get up. So we've now started monitoring and I'll tell you a little bit about how that's going later. But um, we also do bird surveys in paired control and treatment sites, which will be a really nice data set in the future to see how this pro project is tracking and the effects of the mistletoe put it being put back into these uh, ecosystems. So just a couple of photos to show we've picked and planted over 2,000 seeds now over a couple of years. And just showing you here, um, you can see the arborist there. He's just popping the seed out, planting it on the underside of a branch. And this is basically just mimicking what a mistletoe bird would do in nature. So where they would um, poop out the seed, wipe it onto the un uh, wipe it onto a branch, and it'll basically attach there. We're just um, yeah popping it out ourselves, and you can even see down in this bottom photo a little ants come along to sort of look at the the um, sugar. There's a lot of sugar content in the fruit itself that the birds like. So yeah, he's just coming to check out uh, what this little thing is that we've just planted there, and it's just showing that we're marking the seeds, so we can actually come back and see when they've germinated. And I'm just going to quickly see if I can play this. This is just showing you how talented the group of arborists that we have are that work for us. They get up these trees so quickly. Um, I've actually tried this and um, it was very embarrassing. It did not look anything like this. So once they get the line over, which is probably the tricky bit, throwing a weighted line over the branch they want to climb up, they just walk up so easily so they're amazing to work with and you can see those couple of clumps there that one of the guys is going up to pick from so we need to get the mistletoe up high like this for regent honey eaters to have those nesting sites and foraging locations in the future so this is just showing you there this is the nice ripe fruit that we've picked ready to plant so if you wanted to actually plant your own, you could give this a go in your um, garden. So you can source some ripe fruit, just have a look around your local area, see if you can spot uh, a clump of mistletoe and wait for some ripe fruit. 
Um, if you can, remove it with the stalk still attached so you, you, you'd you stop the process of it actually germinating because once air gets in there, it'll actually start to germinate. But if you're going to pick and plant on the same day, that's fine. Just basically pick it. You can keep it for a short time in the fridge, um, just in, your, in a Ziploc bag, and then basically go out and get planting and just wipe it on an underside of a small branch. And I'm sure that um, Dave will tell you this too, mistletoe planting is a numbers game. About 90% will germinate, but only about 10% will become mature plants. So it's really get as much out there as you can. Don't really worry too much about putting a fair bit in one tree because they're not all going to survive. And then this is to show you that it does actually work. So I've got a little image up the top there to show you when they get their two little cotyledons, um, those little early emergent leaves. Um, so that's just showing it probably, I'd say, a couple of months after it, it's germinated. And then we went back seven to nine months post those plantings that we did. And we found we've had about a 13% survival rate. This is actually quite good in the world of mistletoe because many will actually they'll be sloughed off through bark shed, they'll be predated by possums, birds, insects, that type of thing. So especially with things like a spotter gum, a smooth bark tree that sheds its bark annually, it's important to think about bark shed timing if you're going to be doing mistletoe planting. And we found it's definitely a great idea to plant on the underside or the side of small vigorous branches. Um, planting in junctions wasn't particularly uh, very good. We didn't find a lot of the time that was where a lot of bark sh um, was shed from. Epicormic branches, it's tempting to plant down low on spotted gums where you can actually do it yourself and don't need an arborist. But actually a lot of those branches, um, you know, they actually fall off later as the tree, tree gets taller. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's great if you can get up a bit higher to those vigorous branches. Uh, just showing here, we held a lovely knowledge sharing workshop um, back in April of um, 2000, uh, this year, 2022, and this is just showing the group of people that um, were on Wanneroo Country to actually talk about um, the cultural and ecological significance of these woodlands. We all did a lovely um, painting to sort of signify um, the knowledge that was shared on the day, and it was just really special to be out there with Wanneroo elders, learning from them and then sharing our knowledge um, from an ecology perspective of, of what occurs out there and um, what we're doing with the mistletoe project. And yes, the word is definitely spreading of the work that we've done. Um, I know that Catherine has sent around a flyer that was made um, with Hunter Local Land Services, but we've also been um, on the cover of Audubon magazine, a very famous ornithological magazine based um, in the United States. And Australian Geographic has done a feature that did talk about our mistletoe project. So the word is getting out there. So I'd love for, for you to all tell people about um, the benefits of planting mistletoe and you can you can get that brochure in that link that Catherine sent. So just acknowledging our talented arborists and all of the organisations that have made this project possible. Uh, the New South Wales Environmental Trust has just recently uh, granted us three more years of funding so we can continue planting mistletoe throughout the Hunter Valley. So thank you very much for, for listening. So I'll hand over to um, Dave and he can tell you the ins and outs or the secret life of mistletoe. Who knew? <laughs> thanks, Catherine. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, and thanks for coming along uh, virtually to, to, to hear us uh, babble on about these weird plants. So I'm going to give you a little <laughs> rundown um, onto the broader uh, sort of background around mistletoes, how they do what they do. Um, because technology is a wonderful thing, we like to try things a bit differently this time. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to need to say next uh, each time the uh, slide is advanced. So next. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, so That's lots of people, um, this kind of work does not happen just by one person alone. So many people have been uh, involved in this. I should say I'm coming to you um, from Wiradjuri country, uh, unceded land, uh, and recognise the um, the tremendous contribution of First Nations people um, and their uh, Indigenous leaders, um, past, present uh, and emerging. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, so I'm, I'm a professor of ecology at Charles Sturt. I work on a range of different projects. Mistletoe is one of the hats that I wear, but I wear a few others, uh, including acoustic stuff. I do a lot of work in the arid zone um, and I've got a few ongoing projects in Latin America as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but mistletoe is my um, my favourite child, uh, and 
I've got ongoing work in a range of different capacities. That central photo there with the red flowers, that's a, a new mistletoe we found in Colombia, um, working with mixed media artists, all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, so yeah, what you're seeing now is just a little, a little glimpse into a big rambling house that is my mistletoe um, um, program. Uh, next, please. So this is where we're going. I'll give you a quick, quick rundown on a few things um, on mistletoes. Really point out two of the main things that they do in terms of their effects on diversity, and that's with insectivores and litter, and with nectar feeders and nectar. So really picking up on the the um, the, the really innovative work that Christy was, was summarising just before. Talk about management. What do you do when there's too much? What do you do when there's not enough? Um, and, and then hopefully plenty of time for questions uh, next. So this is a tasting platter. Uh, yep, you get the idea. Grab a bunch, move on. Um, next, please. Okay, so um, please don't think that you're a, a, don't feel bad if you think all these things are the case. Uh, they're not the case. Uh, those are all misconceptions. So let's bust a few myths about mistletoes. Firstly, they're introduced weeds, aren't they? No, they're not. Next slide, please. They're locals. They're as local as kangaroos and emus. There's a bunch of them around the world. There's 97 in Australia. Just found a new one, that picture there in, in um, WA. That's a new Lysiana. It doesn't have a name yet. So we'll get to 100. We'll, we'll crack that century in the next five or 10 years, no problem at all. Uh, next one. Aren't they really toxic? Like little Johnny um, had, some, had some mistletoe. Is that going to be a problem? Uh, au contraire. Good food, very tasty, recommend it. I can give you recipes. Uh, don't they kill trees? That's that's a big one. Um, I get I field a lot of calls on this. Mistletoes kill trees around as frequently as fleas kill dogs. I mean, it does happen, but it's a pretty crooked dog if a few fleas are going to knock it off. And that's the same with mistletoe and trees. Trees, um, a healthy tree is what a mistletoe needs. Um, a mistletoe has no interest in killing um, the tree that it's 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 attached to, literally biting the hand that feeds it. Um, so they can have effects on growth. They can have effects on vigour, uh, especially during times of shortage uh, like droughts. Uh, and then the last one uh, about about sick uh, sick trees. We found actually the reverse that um, doing a lot of inoculation experiments, like Christy has pointed out, in, uh, you're doing in the hunter. If you put a bunch of seeds on a bunch of plants. Um, it's only really those vigorous trees that have abundant resources to share that end up hosting mistletoe to, matu to maturity. If the tree's struggling to pay the bills, there's no, no spare change left for the mistletoe. Uh, next one. So this is a quick romp through. Um, just, a, just a reminder to pause and uh, reflect on the fact that these are a gorgeous group of native plants. Like, look around your garden. You'll have kangaroo paws. You'll have bottle brush. You'll have all sorts of cool things. Uh, and you might think of Australia as a pretty special place in terms of native flora. Mistletoes are one of those groups that I think are right up there in terms of one of the really interesting components of our flora that you just don't see in other parts of the world. Most other mistletoes are a bit skanky. Uh, our mistletoes are, um, well, they're gorgeous. Uh, next. And if you want to know more about these, these plants, this is a very quick romp through. Uh, it's all in the book, um, CSRO Publishing, your friends, your family, that weird neighbour down the road, they all deserve a copy. Uh, next. So uh, very quickly, mistletoes aren't just one thing. There are multiple groups of plants that have evolved independently from root parasitic ancestors. And so this is a very complicated diagram showing you a family tree of all the mistletoes of the world when it finally renders. There we go. Uh, and uh, the green there is mistletoes. The purple are root parasitic plants. So a lot of those details are, are superfluous. Um, just understand that the things we call mistletoes have evolved independently five times. There's five families of plants we call mistletoes. And these guys, the mammals, were involved in their origins and early diversification. They're currently dispersed by birds. Oh, spewing dog, just a sec. Maybe. All right, rescued. Uh, but we rely on, um, uh, they rely on birds now, uh, but, but mammals were the 
the selective force that drove the evolution of mistletoes to begin with way back before birds were even a thing. So mistletoes actually predate birds. Just give your mind a chance to expand to accommodate that fact. Next. So let's look at effects of mistletoe on diversity, a question dear to my heart. Um, next slide, please. So we did a large experiment to, to look at this. Uh, it's a bit perverse, but in order to really quantify how important something is, a really useful way to do that is to take it away. Um, and there's an idea out there that mistletoe acts as something called a keystone, an ec ecological keystone. Uh, so we looked, um, uh, and, and the cassowary is a classic example of that. It supports um, a, a, a forest full of diverse um, animals. Um, it's the only bird large enough to, to disperse a lot of those large seeded rainforest fruits. Um, so a classic example of a keystone, just one bird of 300 you might find in New Guinea or, or Cape York, but take that one bird away and there's nothing dispersing all those trees, the forest becomes uh, lower diversity uh, if, if they go away. So next slide. So we did this um, in southern New South Wales, just um, just up the road from where I am now, uh, near the town, uh, centred on the town of Holbrook. Those little red dots there are, are 40 woodlands uh, on private land in box gum grassy woodland. Next slide. Uh, we did a bunch of work surveying who lives in these places, uh, and then, next slide, uh, took mistletoe away. See the mistletoe there? Oh, yep, and click the button, and oh, mistletoe gone. Yep, okay. So we did that thousands and thousands of times, removed tons of mistletoe from, next slide, from half the woodlands, left the other woodlands alone, and demonstrated, wow, it really is uh, an ecological keystone. Take mistletoe away, do nothing else, just leave it where it falls, you lose a third of your birds within three years. Species. A third of your birds just go away. Um, and so that's, you know, there's a few keystones out there, killer whales, those cute little sea otters. They, you know, they're, they're cellar dwellers compared to mistletoe in terms of its, its, its ecological effects. Mistletoe has um, 174 times greater an effect on diversity than you'd expect based on its, its um its biomass in, a, in, in, in the woodlands we studied. So it's really important stuff. Uh, next, please. Um, and this was interesting. Um, many parts of the world think mistletoe is kind of interesting to begin with. Um, so when this when this study was 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 uh, was published, uh, the media got very excited. Uh, next, please. But we were still concerned because we really wanted to work out the, the mechanism because when we looked at it, it wasn't the birds were expecting. It wasn't those nectar feeders or the fruit eaters or the things that like to nest in mistletoe. It was insect eaters that did all the heavy lifting. So that big arrow there, those those dots on the uh, on the graph to the uh, to the left, um, that's just summaries of diversity before uh, and after. Uh, so proportional change in diversity. Uh, in those sites where we took mistletoe away, uh, the red sites, uh, and the blue sites, those sites we just, um, oh, sorry, I've got that wrong. Sorry, the blue sites is where we took mistletoe away treatment, uh, and the red sites, the controls, doing nothing else, bang, lose all that diversity, and that's all driven by insectivores. Take the insectivore pattern away, there's no difference between those um, those red and blue dots directly beneath the, uh, the shrike thrush there. And not just any insectivores, but ground foraging insectivores. So we've got this perverse situation where we see this really pervasive effect of, of, of this plant on bird communities, but the birds most affected don't do anything with mistletoe. They're, they're stooging around on the ground. So this is a real unscratchable, and we just had to had to look further, had to do some more work. Uh, next slide. Uh, and so for this, um, we, we need to think a bit more about the birds. We know what these ground foraging birds are, uh, are up against. They're in real trouble. We call them declining woodland birds for a reason. They're not thriving. They're shrinking back to inland parts of their range, to northern parts of their range, things that were previously very common around here, where I'm sitting now, uh, things like great ground babblers. They're just not around anymore. Those ground foraging birds are the ones that seem to be most sensitive to, to mistletoe, and they're telling us something. Uh, next slide. And so really, rather than thinking about it from a bird's point of view, next slide, we needed to think about it from an insect's point of view. Next slide. Uh, so we did a bunch of experiments, small scale experiments, not giant woodland experiments, uh, lots of numbers. Uh, the key thing there is some insects are preferred food by insectivores. We call them tasties. Next slide. 
Um, once you mix, mix around uh, litter and look at what kind of insects do you find in mistletoe litter as opposed to um, just eucalypt litter, so looking beneath trees with mistletoes in them uh, and trees without mistletoes in them, you find a buttload more tasty insects beneath those infected trees. Uh, next slide. So of all those numbers, 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 two and a half million is a big number. The adding mistletoe to the canopy of woodlands at around seven to 10 plants to the hectare, not high densities, and you've got two and a half million little insectivore snacks uh, per hectare per year. So if you're a manager of, of a, land, a landscape and you're concerned about particular critters and you've got the lever that you can reach for that says more food, please, well, you're going to yank on that lever. And, and, uh, and so mistletoe is, 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 is most definitely very influential as far as that particular pathway goes. Mistletoe, mistletoe litter, falls down, nutrients, nutrients, lots of insects, gobble it up. So uh, the pathway is now very clear, but at the start it was a, a really mysterious pattern. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, that, that's fine, that's detailed, lots of bugs. Next slide. So it might seem a bit of a strange link um, that insectivorous birds a ground foraging little layer, but this is feeding into a much broader pattern we're seeing um, about woodlands and about productivity and the real important um, roles that coarse woody debris, the burrowing animals, uh, and the soil health play in our woodland ecosystems. And interestingly, uh, you'll be seeing many reports about global insect declines. Um, so that's that's all part of this as well. And so the reason why so many insectivores are in trouble is you know their prey, the insects are just becoming scarcer and scarcer as those those rich littery woodlands are converted to to scorched earth uh, car parks and um, yeah and housing developments uh, next uh, so there's a there's a known pathway now that's been replicated by many studies worldwide showing that mistletoe litter is is worth its weight in pickled onions it's great stuff it's full of goodies it's enriched uh, cations Australian soils are terrible, uh, and many of the of the nutrients that plants struggle to find are actually bound up in, 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 in their tissues, and mistletoe releases that as a parasite. It slurps it out and drops it in the in the feeding zone of, of the plant. In that time, uh, microbes, fungi, all those uh, uh, litter-munching uh, invertebrates can have a crack at it, and that then really supercharges um, food webs from the, from the bottom up. Uh, next slide, please. So that's that's a quick view about one particular pathway that it took 20 years to unravel. Um, and one of the secrets to understanding how it works so effectively is because mistletoe isn't just random. It's not just one here, one there. You get it in patches. You get it in patches at multiple scales, from landscape scales, some areas have lots, some areas have none, right down to individual trees. One tree has a lot none of those other trees do and that leads to this small scale patchiness in nutrient availability directly beneath the mistletoe there'll be 10 times more potassium five times more calcium six times more more magnesium um, than you know two meters that way and that's the kind of thing that drives diversity in little things um, soil microbial fauna insects uh, and herbaceous plants uh, next um, I'll skip this. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> so that's one interaction. There's many, many other interactions involving mistletoe. Things nest in it. There's lots of insects that only feed on it. Uh, lots of animals move it around, as 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 uh, as Mick mentioned, um, with uh, the sticky seeds. Uh, next slide. One thing I want to focus on, though, is the is the nectar. Um, and so, uh, some very recent work published this year. Uh, looked at nectar feeding birds uh, across southeastern Australia, 2,000 and, and, and uh, 2,100 monitoring sites, so massive effort. Um, next slide, over about a five year period, um, and found a bunch of things. Found that during a drought, mistletoe was the most reliable uh, nectar source. Even though it's a minor component in these woodlands, you got you know dominance of, of various uh, eucalyptus uh, species. Um, when they're not flowering during a drought, the only shop open is mistletoe. And so many of the nectar feeding birds, including region honey eaters, they're basically, they're dependent uh, on that one group of plants. Uh, next slide. But the troubling thing is, as the drought wore on, 
those mistletoes just curled up their toes and died. So this same study that found, huh, those freaky little plants, they're really important for nectar feeders. Oh, yeah, during droughts. And, oh, yeah, but if the drought keeps going, yeah, they all die, those those freaky little plants. So so you've got nectar feeders that kind of backed into a corner and then and then and then really are running out of options. So there's some genuine concerns about not just reagents um, as an individual species, but the broader uh, nectar feeding community, um, and what that means in terms of their pollination services. Uh, and, and and you know if these eucalypts aren't getting pollinated, um, then the whole system starts to break down. So there's some real concerns about this work. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is led by Ross Crates uh, and the ANU team. Um, Mick was involved in this work, uh, as well as a cast of, of thousands there. Uh, if you want, if you want more information uh, about that, and we're seeing similar work uh, in Chile as well. So it's not just an Australian thing. You can have too much of a good thing. You can have too much of a good thing, um, and there are things you can do if you're driving down the road and you see that. So oh, that's not right. That tree is not happy. Um, if there's more mistletoe there than the tree can support, that that tree is is going to have a bad time. Uh, but what you're seeing there is a symptom of a much larger series of issues, not actually to do with mistletoe, but to do with the factors that would normally keep mistletoe in check. And in your part of the world, as as in, as in at my end, uh, brush-tail possums and occasional fire are the two main factors that keep mistletoe numbers in check. Um, and in, uh, some mistletoe-munching insects as well and so if there's no hollows around, if there's just open ground, the possums aren't going aren't to cross, you're going to get mistletoe numbers building up and up and up, and there's nothing nothing to check them. So you can spend a lot of money, go in there and snip them off, but five years' time they'll be back again. So addressing that through broader scale restoration, getting hollows and hollow-bearing trees back into the landscape, getting nectar-bearing shrubs that support butterflies back into the landscape, and the occasional cool burn um, that our traditional owners can can really you know teach us more about uh, is is critical to getting things much more in uh, in balance. Uh, I'm conscious of time. Let me just zip through this last little aspect. It's it's a quick and dirty. Uh, next slide. Okay, so um, we've tried putting mistletoe back into a landscape that doesn't have any. This is Melbourne. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and you know, looking at that canopy of of of, of plain plane trees, uh, Tim Flannery's quote comes to mind. He reckons that plane trees are so useless for Australian wildlife. He's going to shout the entire bar if someone brings him a leaf showing its signs of insect herbivory. So next slide. So we took that as a challenge uh, and said, yeah, righto, uh, but you can make them better. You don't have to uh, to replace them. A nice fully mature 50 you know year old tree it's going to take a long time to replace and there's a lot of them in melbourne that's the, the highlight of the area there so next slide how about we we up uh, we plonk mistletoe in them and not just any mistletoe we wanted to go for a mistletoe that climbs on the trunk rather than slurps on the canopy because premature branch fall for that ferrari that's paperwork nobody needs. So, so we went for that species instead that clings to the uh, the trunk. So that's mule rhina. You might be familiar with it, those naturalists out there. It's creeping mistletoe. Instead of one, just one connection to the host, it has multiple connections and it can actually move through the tree chasing sunlight. So we planted a bunch of, um, of seeds. Next slide. And the media got involved. They love this. Gardening Australia. Oh, my gosh. Uh, and we get some signage. We were expecting a lot of blowback from the public about, oh, terrible, kills trees, what are you doing? And it was the reverse. Um, the PR department was loving it. People were like, can you do it in, in, in my garden? Can you do it in my park? People are loving it. So the message is getting through, even, even for Melburnians. And they're, they're a tough crowd. Uh, next slide. Uh, so that's what our babies look like, remarkably similar to Christie's babies. Uh, next. And then... This year, um, uh, in in June, five years after we we planted the seeds, I did the uh, the proper follow up uh, next, and this is the first time that mistletoe has been um, large scale inoculated in a in a city before. So I thought, look, let's live tweet the whole you know extravaganza, and there's one. There is a baby. It's about the size of a football. We put it there. Yay, warm in a glow. Uh, next. Uh, but there's there's more and there's fruit, so we haven't just added them to the landscape. They're now taking care of themselves. And so, of the 26 trees we inoculated back in 2017, 
Uh, five of them now have mistletoes in them, and they're now fruiting and contributing fruit to the next generation. Interestingly, four of those five trees had possum collars fitted on them. So strong evidence that possums are one of the factors limiting mistletoe recruitment uh, in certainly this urban landscape. Uh, next. And just where, where we're going from here, there's some very interesting work that we're doing looking at microclimates and as well as food, as well as shelter and structure, litter and nectar, tasty fruit, all that good stuff, and, and the, the patchiness of nutrients. So they do a lot already. There's more. Um, they add cool spots to the canopies of trees. They're always transpiring. They're always shedding water vapour, especially when it's very hot and very dry. Owls know this. You'll see right in the middle of your, your screen there, there's a booble cow during a 45 degree day, just hanging out in a giant wire leaf mistletoe. Uh, Adding mistletoes to tree canopies changes uh, the whole canopy of microclimate uh, by about 15 degrees when it's especially uh, dry. And so we're looking at what that means for animal persistence in landscapes, but also in terms of urban heat island effects. You've already got a lot of trees in your city. If we add mistletoes to them uh, in a controlled way, uh, could that could that be an extra uh, element of making our cities more livable uh, as heat waves unfortunately become more of a more of a thing. Uh, next slide. So wrapping up, key messages, take a moment. Mistletoe, it's good stuff. Yeah, who knew? Good stuff. Lots of litter, lots of nectar, cool spots and hot canopies, boost resources, not just out in the bush, but also in, in, urban, in urban systems. And you can grow your own and we can tell you how. So thanks so much for your attention and happy to, to field any questions you might have. Thanks, Dave, um, Nick and Christy. Um, so I'm sure listening to all those interesting things that um, all three speakers have been talking about, you'd have some questions. If there's anything else that comes up afterwards, feel free to email Catherine and uh, we can get some answers off to you after this. Can I ask Dave a question? <laughs> while, yeah. while, there's, while there's silence, um, do ringtails browse on the foliage or is it just brushies? Okay, they do, but not often. They nest, they, they use the clumps as, as, dray, as dray sites, so they do, they, they, they do like uh, hanging out in them. So do koalas. Um, they eat them very rarely, uh, whereas brush tail possums, it's one of their favourite foods. Yellow belly gliders, greater gliders occasionally snack on them as well. Um, but from all the data that's around, uh, it's, and not even bobucks, it's brushies, it's common brush tail possums are really the one. Um, but I think in some systems, um, some butterfly larvae, some caterpillars, especially those, those showy Jezebels, um, they're going to be pretty important controlling factors in some systems because if two or three females lay their eggs on one mistletoe clump, those caterpillars will defoliate the entire clump in, in a short space of time. And I guess the thing to bear Sorry. in mind about, about herbivory and also fire, uh, mistletoes are weird because they've got no storage organs. They've got no roots. They've got no ability to store carbs. They're, they're like a, a, a really scrawny greyhound. They've got no storage at all. So if, 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 if they lose their leaves, if they can't make sugar anymore, if they can't feed themselves, even though they're parasitic, they need to make their own sugar. They're just taking water uh, from the host. So no leaves, dead mistletoe. Gabrielle, I actually think I can enable your microphone. So I haven't seen a question go in the chat. So let's have a whirl and see if this works. And you might be able to ask your question live to the guests. Hey, thanks so much. Um, um, I had a question about the inoculation of the London plane trees. Um, given that they're deciduous and go into dormancy, does that have any impact on the hemiparasitic plants? Oh, great question. Clearly a student of plant physiology. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a bit of a suck it and see. So there's been some work done on mistletoes in New Zealand growing on exotic deciduous hosts. And they're, even though they're used to growing on evergreen trees where the light environment stays roughly the same year in, year out, they're able to basically switch on and really crank out photosynthate for half the year when they're exposed 
and then just sit quietly and do very little when they're completely shaded. So the, the growth rates are very slow. So it went from a, a seed to a you know about a football sized plant in five years. So they're not speedy, um, but it was it was a calculated risk and it seems to have paid off. Um, but it's a remarkable example of just how resilient and how adaptive they are that they can handle that kind of completely different host architecture and, and still and still manage to uh, to work things out. Wow, that's phenomenal, all in the one uh, generation as well. Yeah, respect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gabrielle. Um, the Q and we've got a, a question come through the Q and A, so hopefully it is working for some of you. So from Ali, thank you. How advanced does a tree need to be before it can be inoculated with mistletoe? Yeah, I'm happy to, to um, hear Christy's thoughts on this as well, but I'd say. Um, it wants to be sort of as thick as your leg. You want you want a chunky tree. You don't want. I mean, why would you why would you burden an up and comer with with extra bills to pay? So I think you're looking at yeah, as thick as your leg, um, thereabouts. So at least ten years, 10, 10, 12 years old for most ukes. Maybe maybe a bit less for some of the speedy um, uh, growing acacias. Uh, but it needs to be a fully formed tree, not a not a not an actively growing tree. Um, otherwise very low success rates and it can really change the architecture of the tree but i'm keen to hear from christy on her her thoughts oh look we have had some good success on on smaller trees like only sort of oh, i don't know here like this kind of i don't know 10 centimeter to 20 centimeter dvh type thing but um we're calling those reference trees because we really don't know um we've gone back and looked and done some monitoring on lower branches where we've just been able to wipe them on um, and we've had some really good success. There was a small tree that we went back to that actually, I think eight out of the seeds planted, five germinated, and they're all looking fantastic at the moment. But then I was interested to hear that, you know, it's, I mean, I know that long cloud mistletoe is a faster grower than the creeping mistletoe, um, but I'm just wondering how long these particular ones that we planted on these small trees will last, whether the, their branches that are going to end up falling down falling off as the tree grows um, or, or whether they're actually going to you know keep growing at the rate that they're growing so I'll hopefully find out in the next couple of years. <laughs> and I guess one of the things to think about with mistletoe inoculation especially this project in the Hunter is it's not about making the food source it's about training the local seed dispersers oi there's mistletoe here come and say hello, spread the love, and then they'll take care of it for you. So really it's yeah. trying to just recalibrate the system so that those existing dispersers, those existing ecological partnerships, you know, spring back into life again. Yes, definitely. Um, just just on that, so in the Capity Valley, we've been doing uh, tree planting for the Regent Honey at a, since 1993, and it's been, you know, mostly eucalypts, obviously, with a bit of, you know, just a few shrubs and stuff thrown in. One of the properties that we've planted on, we've actually planted across three different years. Uh, and at that property, there have been mistletoes appear in, in trees planted as recently, I think it's 2009. So, you know, around 13, or well, actually, but at the time that we were looking at the, the plants, they would have only been 10 years old. Um, and the trees didn't seem to be bothered at all. And mm -hmm. of interest, we had that like you know out of 25 sites it was think it was number two or three for for bird diversity um in so obviously there must be a mistletoe bird or two that are in just in that in that part of the capity valley depositing mistletoes in these really young ukes that have resulted in you know a, an amazing um, result for for birds so yeah anecdotal cool. but interesting mm -hmm. Um, Darcy, in the um, participants there, I saw you had your hand up. Um, feel free to go ahead if you still had a question. Hey, can you hear me? Yep, sure can. Hey, yeah, I sort of, Mick just sort of answered it, but yeah, I was a uh, bush regen and I was just wondering like how early on in the regen you would try and get them in. Um, but yeah, you sort of said they can handle them when they're fairly young. Um, yeah, so. Well, I mean, like that was only one site in, in one planting program and it was box mistletoe. So perhaps other mistletoes in other ukes, it might be a different result. Uh, so I can't really give a, a, a definitive answer. I guess the other thing, Christy, is that um, one of the places where we've got a proliferation of, of mistletoe around Sassanok and Curry 
uh, places associated with the Hunter Expressway, which I think opened in about 2015. Uh, and a lot of the landscaped on ramps and off ramps and rest areas have young spotter guns that are only going to be about you know, less than 10 years old anyway, mm. that are full of mistletoe, full of the long flower mistletoe. And the spotter mm -hmm. guns, they, they are showing absolutely no sign of, of, of any stress. So again, it's all anecdotal. Don't take that as gospel, but it you know, from from those two examples, it seems that a, a youngish tree can handle. You know, I mean, to be fair, most of those spotted guns have probably only got one or two clumps. They definitely haven't got a, a large number of clumps in them. So, I don't. You know, I think Dave would agree that maybe run an experiment. Maybe you know, have have a section of of your planting where where you, you know, at at year five you you plant a number of mistletoes in your in your trees. See what happens. So, yeah, because. We don't know this stuff, do we? <laughs> Yet. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I have another question in the chat, guys, from Christine. Thank you. If regents don't have five years to wait and yet it takes that long for mistletoe growth, what else can be done? I'll um I'll fill that one. <laughs> so this is a, a, a very contemporary issue. A population viability analysis was done earlier this year. Um, led again by by Ross Crates and the ANU team, um, but using data from BirdLife and and and, and other people, uh, and that population viability analysis, which is basically uh, it's a, a diagnosis of the future of a species, it concluded that if we did nothing, it would go extinct within ten years, hands down, and so it identified three actions that we could do to actually keep the bird going. One is a bit of a no-brainer, protecting known breeding habitat. Uh, one of the other ones was to do releases of of zoo bred birds. Now I did mention that in our um, in in my talk, uh, and that's something that uh, is happening as we speak. Uh, don't <laughs> don't air that too widely because there is a media release coming out this weekend about that. But there is one happening right now. One happened last year. Uh, so as I said, things are that serious for this bird that we actually are now. Uh, relying almost on re the release of zoo bred birds to to supplement supplement the very low wild population. The other thing that we need to do is to facilitate breeding. Regent honey it is their modus operandi is to function as a flocking bird. They used to breed in semi communal flocks along river courses and things. Nowadays you're lucky to find one nest in an entire region, and that one nest is obviously very susceptible to an, a range of, of threats. Um, you know, we, we spend a lot of money on the Regent Honey Eater and all that money, all that effort, you know, there must be maybe 50 to 100 people working on Regent Honey Eaters. All the work that we do can be undone by a pied currawong flying off with a couple of nestlings in the nest that we're trying to get the bird to breed in. So that the bird really is at the mercy of, of so many things purely because of the critically low numbers. It's the, the critically low population, which is what's putting this bird at, at the risk. I mean, all the stuff that came before, I mean, you know, I, I'm not going to say it's irrelevant, but we really, really need to get this bird to breed now. That's that's where it's at. Thank you, Mick. Um, Kevin, I saw you had your hand up, so I'll go to you in just a moment. There's just two questions on the chat. Um, so firstly from Bo, thank you. Dave, anecdotally, I've heard from reliable sources of instances where needle leaf mistletoe have been observed as dead late 2020, but the same plant subsequently found to be at least recovering. Are there certain species mm -hmm. of mistletoe that are exceptions to the rule of if it's crispy, it's toast? <laughs> Great, and yes, uh, as with as with the, the inoculation uh, experiments and looking at what grows on small trees, there's a lot we don't know, and so those those anecdotal uh, instances are often gold mines about about you know what what's possible. So there's the rule is that mistletoes can't handle fire, but there's one species in the Kimberley that can. Um, the rule is that mistletoes can handle being defoliated. I've seen what you've described yourself um, with 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 another uh, species uh, on mulga, mulga mistletoe, Lysiana murrayi. That yeah, um, lifeless, dead apparently, and yet uh, back out it comes. So they can, their physiologies are, are are quite plastic, and they can they can take 15, 20 percent of their carbohydrate budget from the host. They can slurp a little bit of phloem uh, as well as that xylem. Uh, but I think as a rule, um, think of them as water parasites 
and if they can't make their own carbs, they're they're out of options. Uh, but yeah, nature is full of exceptions. So great, great observation. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Bo. Um, so to Ali now, um, are there any good educational programs you know of that worked with farmers to debunk those myths you talked about, Dave? Yeah, a few. So um, I've had a few chats um, with farmer groups. I did one recently in, uh, in East Gippsland that went really well to just speak directly with people who are concerned about this, um, uh, often in the pastoral um, and livestock raising uh, industries rather than croppers. Um, and there's some promotional, some, some educational material uh, around that, that um, LLS, Hunter LLS has, has got some really nice fact sheets um, that really dispel a lot of those myths. So yes, there are some resources around. Uh, and there's some historic ones too. Nick Reed had a great little booklet on managing mistletoe that really put this information out there. So yes, there are resources around. Don't need to make them from scratch. So I'd say reach out to Laurie and the team at LLS and they can, they can uh, get you set up with that. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, for sure. We'll send around a, a follow-up email to all the participants with those resources um, as well. Um, Kevin, did you still have a question? Nope. Speak now. <laughs> yep, you've popped your hand up again. Let me, you should be able to speak, Kevin. Your um, microphone should be on at this end. If not, drop it in the Q&A if you can. If that's not working for you, you can um, drop us a line afterwards and we'll make sure we get an answer from the crew for you. But um, yeah, your mic should be enabled now. Otherwise, we're right on time. So we might look at wrapping up very shortly. I might hand over to Catherine. Thank you, everyone. All right, thank you everyone for um, joining us and I hope you got something out of um, the webinar and learn a bit more about mistletoe and why it's a woodland superhero and that you can now um, spread the word to other people. <laughs> this um, was recorded so it can be um, put up on the Hunter YouTube channel and I'd like to um, especially thank Dave, Christy and Mick for giving up their time tonight and also, especially for Mick because I know he's very busy We'll also send round, when I send the email with the link to the YouTube, um, the obligatory feedback form. Um, that is so that I can report um, what people thought of the webinar to um, our sponsors, I suppose, or funding that was received from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program. Um, in the Hunter, we have a program um, bringing back the region honey eater, which um, funds lots of interesting things, including bird life to do some work and some of the surveys and work that's been done by Ross Crates. So I think if that's all, if no one's got any further questions, I'll sign off and let you go and have some, finish your dinner or have a drink or whatever else you're going to do. <laughs> Enjoy your night. Thank you.